And then I want us to describe uh, the principles for managing GI bleeds in, in uh, more detail about variceal bleeding and cirrhotic. So just before we kind of delve in, um, I just want to give a little bit of background on GI bleeds. So if this is something that is um, you will see and you will need to know how to manage this. So in the US, almost 400,000 people are hospitalized with it. Um, upper GI bleed, surprisingly, is uh, up to an 8% mortality rate, and lower GI bleeds is about half of that. Um, the big thing to know as kind of the leading cause of mortality for these um, GI bleeds is going to be the um, variceal bleeds, which have a mortality up to 20 per, 20%. So let's go ahead and get into a case. So this case has to deal with a 55-year-old uh, male, history of cirrhosis, presenting with hematemesis. So per the ED, they give you a call, said, hey, this guy's coming in. He's got some leg swelling for the past two weeks. And he's complaining about some worsening abdominal pain and decreased PO intake. Why is in the ED, they say he actually threw up um, 50 cc's of some uh, bright red blood. It says hemoglobin stable, baseline, um, blood pressure is normal. And they just wanted him to get admitted for this hematemesis and possible scope with his history of cirrhosis. So you go down there and he says, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling actually much better after throwing up. And he's like, yeah, but I've never had this thrown up blood before. This is something new for me. Um, and then he also kind of reveals to you that he's been having some heavy alcohol binging for the past month. And you look back at his chart, uh, he really only has significant history for the alcohol cirrhosis and diabetes, acid reflux and hypertension. And um, he's on all the medications that you would expect for somebody with this. So I asked a couple people kind of some uh, questions that you would want to know in somebody who's coming in with the GI bleed. And um, if those people don't mind, like either typing in the chat box or kind of saying out loud um, with unmuting yourself and then saying what you guys, what questions you would want to know with somebody who is coming in with the GI bleed. Is there any way we can enable the group chat? Is the group chat not enabled right now? No. I don't know if you can do that while I'm... Sorry about that, guys. We'll uh, get this technical difficulties dealt with for you all. But um, if anybody doesn't mind just like speaking out loud, kind of some, like what's one question you want to, what's one answer that you want to get out of this interaction when you go see this? Like what's a question you want to ask them? I would want to know what medications they're taking, right? Anticoagulation or NSAIDs can definitely affect your likelihood of bleeding. Yeah, good, good. I'd want to know if it has been something that's happened in the past or if this is the first time, and then also like kind of the volume of blood, uh, see if it was something more like a Mallory Weiss tear if you're more concerned with varices. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. There's some uh, people put some chats in, so other great questions, um, alcohol use, presence of melanin, is this painful or is this painless? Um, and yeah, another really couple good questions. Is this person, um, have they had any EGDs in the past, especially in the cirrhotic, that's really important because you wanna know if they've actually had varices seen on imaging because that would put them even high, that would put your differential even higher for that. Um, and yeah, uh, Jordan's asking some really good questions too. Is this guy symptomatic actually from his GI I believe, which I think these are all really good questions and these are exactly what you guys should be thinking about when you walk into this patient's room. So I kind of wrote down some other uh, questions. One that was already said, does this person have a history of prior bleed? Um, does this person have peptic ulcer disease in the past? Um, ever have an H. pylori infection? Uh, does he have a history of cirrhosis? And if he does, has he ever had uh, EGDs done, which was also kind of mentioned? Yeah, and, um, does this, when he says that he's, um, throwing up blood, is this actually bright red blood or is this something that looks like coffee ground MSS? Uh, is this, is he having any black and tarry stools for a while? And um, this has been going on for, makes you think that something's been going on for a little bit longer. Um, somebody mentioned also alcohol use, which is another great question. Another one, is this induced by medication? So you obviously have to think about things that are gonna be thinning their blood or uh, things that will put you at a higher risk of GI bleed by decreasing the, um, uh, protective code of your GI tract. So something like NSAID use or any um, uh, is the big one that we always think about. And then the other things to think about, does this person have a history of cancer that, uh, a history of cancer that could also be like a, uh, causing him to have these GI bleeds. 
And the other one I always like to um, kind of put on the back burner is um, if somebody comes in with complaining about black and tory stools, um, you should also, and going in with medication use, you should also also ask about things that are what we call melanin mimickers. So iron can cause you to have black and tory stools and actually Pepto-Bismol, if anybody's taken it, also causes your stools to be pretty dark too. So those can also be concerning for melanin, but in real uh, real, list, real life, they're really are, uh, the melanin is probably, or the black stools are probably caused by these. So these are kind of your, these are your vitals and your uh, physical exam that uh, you get when you go out, go down there. And I really just wanted to highlight all the important stuff, but vitals look like he's hemodynamically stable. Our rate's a little bit on the high side, but uh, it's not technically tachycardic and blood pressure's normal. And you look at him, he looks actually like he's fine. Um, looks like he's, he's mentating fine. Um, when I put in there with uh, bulging flanks and the shifting dullness, does anybody, can anybody kind of write what that's a, uh, a physical finding of? Yeah, perfect. Jordan put that aside. So yeah, perfect. Those are, um, so those are kind of two uh, really good. Those are two uh, actually with a pretty good positive predictive value for ascites. And was if this ascites is caused with this guy being having a cirrhosis, it's more likely from cirrhosis, but obviously it doesn't tell you what, uh, if the ascites is caused from itself. All right. And so these are his labs. Um, so I just wanted to, I also highlighted kind of really the um, labs that are aberrant in their values. And obviously you look at his uh, hemoglobin, hemoglobin looks stable. Um, his platelets are low for which, um, for your guys' own edification, that's actually one of the, um, that has a, um, if you're looking for what lab value has the best uh, positive predicted value for cirrhosis low platelets is actually that lab value looks like he's uh his inr is a little bit elevated 2.92 so he's a little bit coagulopathic and his bun is bun and creatinine are both elevated but i just wanted to kind of highlight that um highlight on his labs that bun is pretty significantly elevated compared to his creatinine and just uh one of one of those things to reiterate to people too that um, when you see a creatinine creatinine to BUN ratio that's like that high, that's pretty uh, concerning for somebody actually for the BUN, not only being from an AKI but also po uh, also from a, a GI source like his uh, possible GI bleed that we're concerned with him. So I also put all the terms and concepts I to know for GI bleeds. You guys all know this. There aren't like knowing where the ligament of triad sits and what the upper GI bleed and lower GI bleed. Yeah, that's great for step one testing, but in real life, it really doesn't make a huge difference in our man and our um, and what you're going to do for management, knowing that specific spot. The real big reason to know what an upper GI bleed and lower GI bleed are is um, really for the um, intervention and or the um, investigative uh, tools that you're going to use for that. So if somebody has an upper GI bleed, you're uh, more than likely going to be doing an EGD and lower GI bleed, you're obviously going to be doing a colonoscopy and sometimes you might be doing an upper or um, doing a uh, EGD as well if you're concerned for a brisk upper GI bleed. But these are all the terminologies that, um, uh, that I just wanted everybody to remember. I'm sure everybody knows these quite well, but just to think about um, hematochesia, lower GI bleed predominantly, and hematemesis and melanoma, you're gonna think about, and coffee ground emesis, upper GI bleeds for the most part. And so for me, I actually um, did not really, uh, I never really got shown a great picture of what melanin is. And so, you know, everybody here is black and tarry stools, but it's really, uh, for some people, it's like, yeah, that, they have melanin. And really, that's not the exact cause. And so I just wanted everybody to actually see what melanin is, because um, if somebody's complaining about black and tarry stools, you have to, um, you really should, um, you should be checking their stool itself. And um, when you think about melanin, you should be looking for this. So kind of this grease or kind of like greasy, oily appearing stool that looks pretty sticky, not just a regular stool. And so also um, just wanted to just highlight the causes of upper GI bleeds and lower GI bleeds real quick. Um, obviously uh, the most the one we're most concerned about for upper GI bleed is going to be variceal bleed, which is uh, obviously in uh, what we're concerned about in cirrhosis or cirrhotics or anybody with portal hypertension. But it's really, uh, it's not the most common cause, which is going to be peptic ulcer disease, which is going to be uh, far, uh, by far the more, more common cause of upper GI bleeds that you guys are going to come across with. 
And then lower GI bleeds, uh, number one cause of that is going to be diverticulosis. And so um, there are all these other etiologies you got to rule out as well. But the things you got to think um, the most likely cause of a lower GI bleed will be diverticulosis, especially one that's got painful lower GI bleed. So let's get back to the case. Um, so you're all, so you're sitting there, and all of a sudden you get this your first 911 page. You get a call from the nurse. You call back really quick, and the nurse just said he just vomited. He vomited a lot of blood. She says, "Yeah, you're asking how he's doing." He's, you're, she tells you he's responding, but he's pretty difficult to arouse. Just a lot of moans and groans for the most part. So, um, if you're the if you're the uh, person who's uh, fielding this call, what is going to be your first question or first thing you want to report it from the uh, uh, reported from the nurse um, after you get this uh, after you get this report? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jordan, just go ahead and like treat this person right off the bat. Uh, but no, that's perfect. It's you know we want to get these vi get the vitals for uh, vitals for this patient. That is going to be the first thing that you should get from uh, after getting a report like this. And obviously, he looks like he's gotten a lot more tachycardic, and he actually has become uh, more hypotensive, which is all concerning. So you're being the astute uh, physician that you are. You get that repeat CBC. And you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, his hemoglobin really only dropped one point. So obviously not that big a deal, right? Does everybody feel pretty reassured with that uh, hemoglobin being 9.8? <laughs> yeah, good, 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 good. That's perfect. Yeah, so if you think about it, hemoglobin's actually going to, if you look at it, it's actually going to be a percentage of it. So just because you're, um, just because you're actively uh, bleeding you're also losing volume with your red blood cells and so if anything it's just going to be a um, it's just a reflection of the concentration of your blood so your hemoglobin is um, your hemoglobin is not hemoglobin only dropping a point is not reassuring at all and the other thing to look at is white count white count took a pretty big jump too and uh, that also could be from like a stress stress from the GI bleed but it also could be from hemo concentration so that's another thing to kind of keep in the back burner. So question is, is, is this person in hemorrhagic shock? And so one of the uh, really good tables that's done, and I've, it's uh, the first time I ever saw this was when I was on trauma, but it goes over kind of the, it goes over the different stages of shock and the vital signs and the physical exam findings that you're going to see with, uh, uh, by depending on how much volume loss is. And so just wanted to show that um, when you start losing up to, you're, you don't become tachycardic until you lose up to 15 to 30% of your total blood volume, which in somebody who is, uh, if you're average, average normal sized human or average normal sized male and you have a volume of five liters, that's roughly going to be about um, uh, one, one and a half liters is uh, going to be about 30% uh, of that. And so that's the first time you're going to be tachycardic is when you lose about a, uh, almost a liter and a half of fluid. And then you really don't even see their blood pressure drop to uh, till they actually lose up to 40% of their total, um, total blood volume. So obviously when that happens, they've almost lost 50% of their blood when they become uh, hypotensive just laying there. So that is also, so that obviously shows that he's losing a ton of blood. And then, um, by the time you lose over 40%, that's when these patients are going to be confused and lethargic. And with him, that's another, that even is more concerning about his altered mental status at this point. And then the only one to think about is um, we always talk about measuring urine output and uh, your urine output doesn't really start decreasing until you actually lose uh, 15 to 30% of your um, total volume. And so uh, whenever you're measuring urine output and um, it does look like it's taken a dip, you should think that this um, obvious, this is that and the tachycardia are going to be two of the first signs that you're going to actually going to see of a patient who's um, losing blood volume. So just kind of going back to the, just going back to the patient himself. Um, so it looks like we saw his, uh, his heart rate, tachycardic, hypotensive, tachypneic, and then uh, his uh, labs are kind of as they were shown earlier. So is this guy still floor appropriate? You guys sure? You don't think you can manage a, a, a hemorrhagic shock on the floor? Yeah, I guess you're probably right. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, way to kind of lump this guy together and actually kind of 
give a great synopsis of who he is and what's going on and um, uh, um, how long it's been going on for is doing a problem representation. And so I don't, um, I wanted to see if anybody would, uh, either they can type it out or they can say what their problem representation or summary statement of this patient is. And just kind of keep, to keep in mind, um, you gotta say who this patient is, so what, uh, what comorbidities do they have, how long has his illness been going on and what is he actually coming in with? So I'll give you guys just like a couple seconds to think about that. And, Yeah, I think that's I think that's perfect, Alex. That's that describes this guy really well. Um, the only I think uh, probably that little better descriptor that was said about him being in um, uh, shock is going to be the only thing that I would add to it. But yeah, just fifty. So what I have, fifty-five year old guy with alcoholic cirrhosis coming in with ab subacute abdominal pain um, and having large volume uh, hematemesis. Um, and now having, uh, which we, we suspect is upper G, I believe that's complicated by hemorrhagic shock. So really good job guys. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to randomly assign everybody to, uh, to different teams. And so I want you to see, um, what I'll do is I'm going to, um, have a, each team, there's going to be six different teams. The first team is going to talk about what kind of IV access you want. Second team is going to be. What do you want to do for resuscitation and what level of hemoglobin do you want to target for that? Third is um, if uh, with coagulopathies, A, would you reverse this gentleman? And then what would you, um, what agents would you use to reverse them? And then uh, fourth group is going to be about the pharma pharmacologic interventions that we can give to help stop this bleeding. Uh, fifth one would be, um, do we put this person on antibiotics? What would we start um, on, for antibiotics if we do? And then um, the sixth group is going to be the definitive management. Who are you going to call and what are you going to tell these people? Um, what are you going to tell these people uh, about this patient? And um, what are you going to uh, do if this patient happens to re-bleed? So let me just separate everybody in breakout rooms. All right, I'm just going to give everybody like 10 seconds to get back in here. Heard some good discussions by uh, over beside me, so I'm really excited to get some... Uh, get on to this. Okay, perfect. So we're gonna go with the first group about IV access. I wanna hear what you guys, what y'all thought about IV access for this gentleman. What do you guys wanna do? Uh, yes, yeah, so our group talked mainly about uh, peripheral IVs. So uh, we said 16 to 18 gauge, uh, two, one in each arm. Perfect, okay. And so what about a central line? Would you put a central line in this guy? For, uh, to give him blood? Uh, I, th I, don't, I think not yet. Okay. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so uh, the big thing to know about uh, for access for these patients is um, the best thing to make sure that these patients have is uh, two, uh, two peripheral IVs with a 16 and 18 gauge is what you said. Uh, so they're going to be our large bore IVs. So getting a 16, 18 gauge is going to be important. The thing, um, the really good principle to think about with the triple lumen catheter and why you wouldn't want that is um, going with uh, Pasquale's uh, equation. If you look at it, the radius actually, so um, the big deciding factors are going to be the length of the tube and the radius. So if the radius is, so the pretty much of the catheter's fatter, flow rate's going to improve, which is going to be Q. But if the, uh, if the catheter is going to be longer, it's actually going to decrease the flow rate. So even though a, a triple lumen, um, triple lumen is, is going to be a little bit um, thicker, its, rate, it's uh, length that it has is actually going to decrease the flow rate. So if you are going to do central access, um, this person right here beside the IO is going to be what you call a cordis, and you can implant that. And as you look, it's pretty short and, uh, short and uh, 
Um, it's short and it's fat. So um, it's really good about getting uh, blood products or any kind of other fluids in there really quick. Um, and so just like you said, perfectly, um, when you're getting IV access, you talk to the uh, ED, they say, um, you, the big first, one of the first questions you ask them is, is what's IV access? They say they've got one IV. You say, hey, I need two large um, bore IVs or, or so just say, do you have a 16 and or, or do you have two 18s or uh, 18s or a 16 um, in two peripheral IVs? It's a really good job. So um, next one. Uh, group two, if somebody will volunteer, uh, resuscitation, resuscitation for this gentleman. We're going to do blood, uh, blood versus crystalloid for him. Right now when he's in this immediate moment when he's, uh, he's in shock. Yeah, perfect. So um, that's exactly right. So you're going to give this guy fluids right away. The thing you worry about uh, more in this person is going to be the hypoperfusion that he's actually having, uh, hypoperfusion that he's actually having from um, uh, his low uh, volume that he has in general. A the whoever's from ACE is also right. You're going to want to give this person blood, but the first uh, first thing you're going to do in the immediate moment is going to give this person crystalloid. So just because you're going to give this guy blood, don't let that hesitate in your resuscitation measures. Make sure you get um, this person crystal, uh, get this guy uh, volume resuscitated because. Uh, the person having uh, hypoperfusion from his low blood volume is going to kill him before his anemia actually does. Uh, the other thing to think about, if somebody like him who is bleeding as frankly as his, he is and is hypotensive, is to think about doing the massive transfusion protocol. And that's pretty much you have, um, you'll, uh, you, they will bring, um, they will actually uh, uh, bring a, um, a device that actually pumps the blood in quicker. You'll have, uh, Typed in, uh, typed in cross blood, not typed in screen, and they uh, they'll do that, and then they on they have the uh, protocol when they give FFP and other blood products because PRBCs won't have uh, um, those products from FFP. Uh, somebody asked about albumin. Yeah, you can definitely give albumin. It's going to be a lot easier to give albumin here at the U than it is say at Denver Health or the VA. Uh, the U actually the albumin um, is cheaper for the hospital, and so. Um, they're a little bit more liberal with giving out um, albumin in these general in these individuals. Um, uh, so it might you might get a little bit more pushback um, at uh, the other hospitals, but uh, for him, I think it's totally reasonable to bolus him with uh, bolus him with a uh, with albumin um, to start off with for sure. And just make sure when you if you're going to bolus somebody who's in hypotensive shock, make sure you're going to put it one liter one liter an hour. Uh, and so the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, from you guys, from group two, what, uh, target hemoglobin are you going to guys shooting for, for him? Yeah. So a Alex got it right. So, um, uh, target hemoglobin for him is seven. Um, and I'll go over some papers, uh, go over some papers that are going to, we'll go in a little bit more detail. The only time I usually, um, increase the threshold for that is, is a, if somebody's having in STEMI or, or somebody has a significant amount of coronary artery disease and they're having elevated troponin from their anemia, that's a, that is a time where I would actually consider increasing the hemoglobin goal up to um, eight or even sometimes nine. But for the most part, for almost every single patient, goal hemoglobin is going to be seven. And then how often do you guys want to check CBCs? Yeah, this is as sick as this person is. I'd probably go Q four hours on him if he's actively bleeding, ac actively insanguinating. Uh, Q four hours is totally appropriate for this gentleman. And so, just kind of going over kind of the um, uh, why we have the hemoglobin uh, level of seven. So there's been a few uh, big trials that I'll kind of bring up, but uh, one of them talked about res the uh, restrictive, which was a hemoglobin of seven versus a more liberal transfusion. Pro threshold of a hemoglobin of nine. And there was actually a decrease in um, decrease in mortality rate um, in the restrictive strategy group versus the um, uh, more liberal strategy group. And then uh, there was another paper that actually talked about um, uh, aggressive resuscit um, over um, more liberal resuscitation measures too. And they actually did show that there was a uh, Reduction in all cause all calls all cause mortality with the um, restrictive um, restrictive uh, hemoglobin goal shorter length of stays and then the other thing to think about um, 
the other thing to think about too is, is that there's actually going to be fewer rebleeding uh, rebleeding events when you have these more restrictive hemoglobin goals. You, as much as you want to resusc resuscitate these uh, patients aggressively, you don't want to over resuscitate them because that will increase the portal venous pressures themselves. And when that happens, you can have uh, actually paradoxically can cause increased bleeding um, if you over resuscitate them. Well, Commerce got one you prior to randomization excluded. Yeah, Dr. Heppy's put some really good information about this uh, studies before we start. Fun. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Heppy. Uh, if anybody wants to go through the chart or chat to look at those two, uh, and then this was just even a little a uh, little bit more recent study, and it just uh, pretty much confirms that was kind of all the uh, what we were talking about. There's a decrease in all cause mortality, all cause mortality with more restrictive transfusion goals. So, coagulopathy for these patients, um, all these cirrhotics, they're going to have low platelets. Uh, they're going to be coagulopathic. Uh, what goal? Uh, what goal platelet? Uh, what goal of platelets would you have for this patient in group three? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, you want to get get this guy's playlets over fifty thousand. Um, and then, what about INR goals? What is what's your goal for? And let's just say he's not a cirrhotic. What would you kind of shoot for? And somebody who's acting actively bleeding. And this one's a, this one's actually a little bit harder. There's, um, I, you know, honestly, I haven't found I didn't find a lot of good papers actually that talked about. But yeah. Uh, around 1.5 is um, what, what I would shoot for in an uh, individual like this, 1.5 or 2. Uh, the thing to think about with FFP, if you're going to give people FFP, um, is uh, that FFP's INR is going to be 1.5. So if somebody has an uh, INR of 1.4 and you give them FFP, that's not going to touch it. And so kind of segueing into that, um, how, would, uh, how do we fix an elevated INR? Yeah, so I saw two of the big ones, FFP, vitamin K, and there's one more that we can get. Um, if you think about somebody who's coming in with a acute intracranial bleed, say, and they're on warfarin, what would, uh, what would those patients probably get? Transamic acid is not a bad idea. Uh, yeah, k Centra is the one I'm thinking of. The good, good case centra. So yeah, PCC, case centra. Um, yeah, so those are going to be kind of your uh, different more modalities of uh, giving vitamin K. Um, if you want to reverse somebody quicker, you give it. You give the vitamin K either IV or sub Q. If you want to do it, uh, if you're not worried about reversing them in the uh, urgent setting, you can give them. Um, uh, you can get, just give them PO vitamin K. And so just uh, a quick little blurb about tags, because this is something that you'll come across at uh, Denver Health, and I'll always have to remind myself what it, uh, the tags are. There's only three number or three values that I think everybody should know about, and that's going to be your uh, R time, K time, and max amplitude. The big things to know about that, R time's elevated, you give them FFP. K time is elevated, you're going to give them cryo. And then max amplitude is low, you're going to give them platelets and or AD, uh, DDABP. I, I just wanted everybody to uh, have that in case they ever come across tags, which is possible or somebody tells you to get a tag just so you know how to interpret and how, you're, uh, how it's going to change your management once you get those lab results. And so from uh, group four, what IV medications are you going to give this person to stop, um, uh, stop the hemorrhage? Yeah, perfect. So you're going to give this person uh, octreotide. Um, is there any other medications you're going to give somebody with an upper GI bleed? Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. So uh, acid suppression is going to be the first one. You're always going to uh, put this, put anybody who's got, you're concerned for an active upper GI bleed, you're going to put them on acid suppression. So 
you're going to load them with 80 of IV, uh, 80 uh, milligrams of protonics IV, and then you're going to put them on 40 milligrams BID. And the point of that is the higher pH actually stabilizes the blood clot and decreases the rate of rebleeding. And if somebody says, uh, talks about putting them on a continuous infusion of uh, protonics versus actually doing uh, incremental dosing with the BID dosing, there is a, uh, the intermittent dosing is actually not inferior to the continuous infusion. And then just what somebody else had talked about, octreotide. Um, the octreotide is only gonna be given to uh, somebody you're concerned about a serot, or con concerned about um, portal hypertension contri contributing to the um, uh, active bleeding. So really a variceal bleed is gonna be your big one to think about. Uh, the point of what octreotide does, it actually causes splanking vasoconstriction, which is gonna decrease the uh, portal portal blood pressure and so um, it'll decrease the rate of bleeding in these patients and then once you start them on the octreotide if they're having a uh, bare seal bleed you'll continue for 72 hours um, after you start it so what about antibiotics for group five we're going to give this guy antibiotics yeah <sighs> Sorry, the guy? Yeah. nice perfect yes what <laughs> antibiotics do you want to get on Oh, yes, I love it. Zeptraxone. How long, how long do you guys want to treat them for after you uh, give them antibiotics? This one's a little bit. Yep, Sam. Oh, nice. Uh, seven days. So, yeah, so uh, the reason we put these people on antibiotics, so bacterial infections are actually up to 20% of patients with cirrhosis who are hospitalized with GI bleed. So this is, the ceftriaxone is only going to be for these patients who are coming in with, uh, coming in with, uh, who are cirrhotics, who are having upper GI bleeds. These are the patients that you're going to actually put them on antibiotics. And those patients who do not have an acute infection, uh, um, an additional 50% can actually develop an infection while they're hospitalized. Um, so you, is a, is a big thing. Bacterial infections do, uh, reduce the mortality and rates of rebleeding. And then uh, other thing to think about, start them on ceftriaxone. And if you need to put them on a PO option uh, because they're getting discharged, and you need to continue the seven days of treatment, um, you can switch them actually over to ciprofloxacin for, uh, to finish up the seven day course. So yeah, so obviously, I don't think it was understood you're gonna call GI. What, um, uh, so somebody, um, I'll, I'll get to that question in a second, but, uh, so somebody's calling, a, calls the GI consult, uh, what, um, what, what are you going to tell this person and, uh, what are you going to say? So, uh, uh, what are you going to say to your GI consult once you give them a call? What are the big questions that they're going to want to know or big yeah, answers to their questions that they're going to want to know? Yeah, perfect. Those are three big ones. What's one thing they're gonna know to, yeah, are they stable? Perfect. Yeah, good, good. I think those are really kind of the big ones to think about. So A, is this person having an upper GI bleed? They're gonna, if you're gonna say somebody, um, if somebody comes in with melanoma, they've got a cute, um, they've got a drop in their hemoglobin from their baseline and you want GI to scope this patient, you're gonna make sure, you're gonna to have to do a rectal exam to see if they actually have, um, are having Frank Melina on their rectal exam. Because if that's the case, then you're gonna to need to, um, that's more concerning that they are having an active GI bleed. Um, somebody mentioned it, cirrhosis, varices. Have they ever been scoped in the past, prior GI bleed? Uh, what meds are they taking? So they're gonna to wanna to know um, if they're on NSAIDs, makes the higher suspicion for somebody having peptic ulcer disease, they have alcohol, do they drink alcohol if they're heavy drinkers? You think about esophagitis, esophagitis, gastritis, those things causing the, um, causing the bleed. And then, yeah, are these people hemodynamically stable? That's going to dictate, uh, that's going to dictate pretty, um, the, the big thing that's going to say if this person needs to be scoped urgently, emergently, and then just kind of go over what you have been giving them and tell them what medications they're on. So, and, uh, one of the big things just to, um, when you get to your uh, endoscopy report is um, I, as an intern always uh, would call GI to get, uh, to know, Hey, can this pay, when can this patient re patient eat? 
how long are they going to be in medications for? And they would always just tell me to go look at the endoscopy report. So just a, um, a good thing to know um, is look at the endoscopy report. They'll tell you what medications to continue them on for how long. And then when these patients can, uh, if these patients are safe to discharge and when will they be safe to discharge? And these are just some fancy pictures of some uh, duodenal ulcers that you can see. And so say this person actually, you get a call about this patient, um, get a call about this patient who's actively uh, re-bleeding. Uh, what are you gonna do for this? What options do you have for a uh, cirrhotic who re-bleeds? <laughs> Looks like Jordan copy and pasted this. Yeah, perfect. So um, Jordan went into a little bit of detail about uh, the second part that I'll mention too, but kind of in the acute setting of somebody's re-bleeding, this is by this point, if somebody's having an active variceal bleed, whether it be gastric varices or esophageal varices, um, and you're having a, you're having a, a failure from their uh, initial uh, endoscopy, uh, the big thing to think about is if they can't, if they're actively bleeding, you can actually uh, have a repeat endoscopy um, to uh, look to place a uh, balloon tamponade on these patients. So you'll call them a uh, Minnesota or Blakemore tube, or just a Blakemore tube is what I always uh, call it. Uh, um, and the other thing to think about is, and then while you're doing this, uh, I would call IR about emergent tips procedure, um, which tips, I'll show you a picture of what that looks like and actually what the balloon tamponade looks like. But tips is uh, the process is just connecting, the whole point of it is to, to connect your hepatic vein to your portal vein to decrease the portal venous pressure to offload the pressure in your varices that'll decrease the bleeding. So this is actually what the Blakemore Minnesota look like. So you actually insert it in there. These patients are intubated already and you actually um, expand it. That'll actually cause physical tamponade on the varices, whether that be gastric varices or if they're going to be esophageal varices. And then this is just a kind of a quick picture of what the TIPS procedure looks like. So you can actually see uh, the hepatic vein here uh, that's connecting with the portal venous system. And so, like I said, the big thing you uh, that'll do is that'll decrease the uh, portal, um, that'll decrease the portal venous pressure, which is going to, because um, it's bypassing the liver and that's gonna decrease the pressure in your uh, varices and your esophagus and or your gastric varices. The one thing to always keep in mind, which actually in somebody, um, and it's a non-emergent indication. Um, it is contraindicated for somebody who's got a history of hepatic encephalopathy to get a TIPS procedure because it can actually precipitate. Um, it can, because if you think about it, uh, hepatic encephalopathy has to do with metabolism of the ammonium, and there's a lot of complexities. But when you completely bypass the liver, if somebody's got a history of hepatic encephalopathy, it can precipitate hepatic encephalopathy. So if somebody has a TIPS, they have uh, increased confusion. Just always keep that in the back burner to think about um, hepatic encephalopathy in these, in, in these individuals. So um, I just I have three questions, but just for time's sake, let's just do one of these questions uh, for uh, for this one. So, 62 year woman, alcoholic cirrhosis, evaluated for hypovolemic shock, hospitalized 24 hours ago with upper GI bleed. Um, she underwent upper endoscopy and bleeding distal esophageal varices, was controlled by epi injection banding uh, with varices noted. Uh, she vomited, she rebled, vomited 300 cc's of blood, is on uh, lactulose, rifaximin, protonix, norfloxacin, octreotide. Uh, vitals look like she's hypotensive, uh, she's not tachycardic. Uh, she's not, she's a little bit to kip neck, saying final room air. And then her labs show a hemoglobin of eight, platelet, platelet count of 74 and INR of 1.4. Uh, which of the following is most appropriate immediate uh, management for this patient? All right, so make a one with D. And actually, it's give this person actually some flu. Yeah, so it's uh, go ahead and infuse this patient. Probably with them having 300 cc's of active blood and their hemoglobin's eight. Uh, like before, um, this is a little bit of a trick question, but the point of it is, is just because you have a normal hemoglobin, you should not think that this person's uh, is not actively bleeding and their hemoglobin's not going to be low. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through these, and so we can just. Um, Go just a quick reminder. Uh, remember, always access, 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 access. Two large uh, peripheral bore, two peripheral large bore IV, sixteen eighteen gauge. Uh, the medications for varicose bleeding: ceftriaxone, octreotide, and protonix. Uh, transfuse these patient, patients as needed. 
Um, and if they're actively bleeding, uh, fix their co coagulopathy too. So with that, I'll open up the floor to see if anybody has any questions. So somebody asked uh, if somebody, if nurses can truly smell melanin. Uh, I don't know about that one. I know there is a there is a specific smell to melanin. My palate isn't quite sophisticated enough to differentiate a regular stool smell versus melanin, but I can tell you it does, when I've seen melanin, it definitely smells bad. Corey, I'll go ahead and say that I think most of the interns in this call will be able to smell melanin before too long. <laughs> It's not, it's not like nurses smell and see if it's a 50, 50 proposition. It's, it's pretty clear. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I, I whenever I've smelled uh, upper GI bleed, uh, somebody stole after an upper GI bleed. Um, it is, uh, it does smell pretty bad. Uh, it's a, so somebody asked, um, so transfusion threshold, how does the initial case of major bleeding differ from the last one? So that the big point of that is that person's hemoglobin, um, it's kind of in the same principle. Uh, if this person, this person's in shock. And so the, uh, the person's in shock. And so you need to resuscitate this person aggressively, even though their hemoglobin is eight on their recheck, uh, they're, it's going to be a falsely elevated hemoglobin since it's more of a concentration. You're using losing active volume too. And so, um, this person threw up 300 cc's of blood, so you have to suspect that they're act they're actually actively um, actively bleeding, and their hemoglobin is going to be probably be much less than that eight. So you should just go ahead and plan to transfuse that patient. And then Evan talks about: um, Would you ever consider giving cryo for acute blood loss? And uh, okay, Sneha is opening that. And I, I agree. I I wouldn't do that. Uh, I wouldn't do that for. Um, I wouldn't do that just because somebody was actually bleeding. If their fibrinogen was low, less than a hundred, I would uh, give them cryo at that point. But I don't know if Dr. Connors or Dr. Heppy have any um, thoughts about that as well. I can let Dr. Heppy throw a, throw a thought in there if he wants. Sorry, just unmuting there. Um, <laughs> What was the question? Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so would you ever consider giving cryo for acute blood loss from an upper G, I believe? Um, you know, I don't think, I, I don't think outside of a, a, a objective indication, which would be low fibrinogen if I thought they had DIC, um, you know, um, I suppose if you're, if you have massive um, hemorrhage and you're, and you're initiating the massive transfusion protocol, you're going to be burning through your fibrinogen anyway. So that's probably an instance to give it empirically before you have a lab test back. But in general practice, I very rarely give cryoprecipitate um, in the setting of upper GI bleeds. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with Dan on that. And I actually follow the trauma literature for massive bleeds. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that if, you, if a bullet goes inside of you and blood comes out, that you're losing whole blood and that you should give that person whole blood because they're losing, they're losing their their clotting factors and their red cells and their white cells and their platelets in, in proportion to one another. Um, when you don't have a bullet hole, it doesn't mean you're still not losing whole blood. And so if someone's losing massive volumes of whole blood, I do transfuse them at a one to one to one ratio, <clears throat> or at least a two to one to one with red cells, uh, platelets and FFP. And then that's going to get you the right amount of missing cryo. Perfect. And Dan, sorry for calling you out there. That was unintentional. <laughs> no that's cool fantastic um well if uh if anybody has any other questions about anything we talked about um uh, don't hesitate to send me or any of the other chiefs an email and i'll uh i will definitely get back to you as quick as i can but i know you guys are uh first day on and so i know you guys are uh busy but good uh good job everybody on this and um 
uh, I, uh, from what I'm hearing, everything's going great. So if you guys have any other issues, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Okay. All right. Thanks guys.